And I was, let me just lead off by saying predicting space, predicting the future is hard. And I want to show you something. I have three postcards from the year 1900 that the illustrator was asked to predict what life might be like in the year 2000. And I just want to show you these postcards. OK, here's one. Uh, they imagined that steamships would also have railroad wheels on them because steamships were big and the railroad was big. So of course, in 100 years, you would combine the two of them and you would just drive right off the ocean onto the land. Here's another one. Of course, everyone would just be floating on the water because, of course, that's what we want to do <laughs> in the future. Here's my favorite. Remember, this is 1900. Uh, powered air airplanes began in 1903. But, of course, people wanted to fly. And so here are people just flying, <laughs> not imagining that if any of those fell out of the sky, you would just be dead. <laughs> so predicting the future is often an exercise in extending what you already know, but not inventing something completely new out of left field and out of the ether. So it's possible to predict the future within 10 years, maybe 20, because often that is an extension of what you know. But beyond 30 or 40 years, 50 years, it's an almost hopeless exercise given the pace of technology that we have, given the rate at which technology converges in ways that are not obvious and could not have been extrapolated at the time you engaged in that exercise. <clears throat> I also want to offer you some what I would call embarrassing quotes, space quotes. Often people look in the literature and they find, they find futurists and they pick the one or two predictions they made and say, look, they knew the future. Well, I did the opposite of that. I collected quotes from important people that were just plain wrong. They're often just forgotten because we like to remember the hits and not the misses. Here, <clears throat> we are remembering the misses. From 1900, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, a New York City newspaper, it is scarcely possible that the 20th century will witness improvements in transportation that will be as great as were those in the 19th century. That has got to be the most boneheaded comment ever printed in a newspaper editorial. Again, they were riding high on steamships and uh, the internal combustion engine car was a recent invention. The, the country was crossed by railroads and they're saying, oh my gosh, nothing can top this. And in three years, we have an airplane. 66 years after that, we've landed on the moon. So this exercise in predicting the future is rife with embarrassing moments. How about this one? <clears throat> Man will not fly for 50 years. Uh, who said that? Wilbur Wright to his brother, <laughs> Orville, in 1901, two years before they both flew. You think if the two guys who invented airplanes can't get it right, what hope do the rest of us have? Here's another one. No flying machine will ever fly from New York to Paris. This is a trend that will continue up until 1957. The trend is there is some advance, and people constrain that advance. So this quote came out after we knew how to fly. Now they're saying we'll never fly to Paris. Who said this? Orville Wright, 1908. How about this one? Landing and moving around on the moon offers so many serious problems for human beings that it may take science another 200 years to lick them. Science Digest, August 1948. It did not take 200 years after this. It took how long? 20 years, 21 years. So these are people who should know better. This is a, a magazine that thinks about science. Technology was surely advanced then. So what was missing? Well, let's keep going. <clears throat> Man will never reach the moon, regardless of all future scientific advances. Radio pioneer Lee DeForest. What's significant about this is that it's on February 1957. This is six, seven months before Sputnik. 
nine months before Sputnik, launched October 4th, 1957. The moment that happened, the instant that happened, all of this changed. All of a sudden, the technology became real. The ambitions became real. And then people went back into the future predicting business, but then they began to overpredict. It happened basically overnight. A manned lunar base will be in existence by 1986. Who says that? The Futurist, 1967. The Apollo program is already in progress. So we know space is within access to our technologies. But we're assuming that we'll continue at that rate. Sorry, I didn't finish the quotes on the other side. <clears throat> we assumed that what was in progress would continue unabated. And that assumption was based on deeply false premises. Let me not use the word false, I'll be more severe and say deeply delusional premises. A premise that I will attempt half of this talk to convince you of. How about this? I'm convinced that before the year 2000 and over, uh, is over, the first child will have been born on the moon. Who said that? Werner von Braun, the guy who invented the Saturn V rocket. So people are, again, thinking that the pace that had been put into play was something natural for the human spirit, the human DNA. What else were we predicting for the year 2000? By the year 2000, 50,000 people will be living and working in space. 50,000. I checked. In the year 2000, there were three people living and working in space <laughs> on the International Space Station. Mixed in with this is also some foggy memory, particularly on my side of the ocean. Okay? We, in America, we think of ourselves as space pioneers. It's easy to think that because we landed on the moon. It's easy to think that we were driven by a certain sort of intrinsic uh, patriotism, an intrinsic pride. But if you unpack it, that's not what shows up. Here's a quote, I'm not that interested in space. John Kennedy said that to the head of NASA in 1962. John, the man who we all associate with launching the Apollo program. This came out of his mouth. This is, whether we like it or not, a race. Everything we do ought to be tied to getting to the moon ahead of the Russians. John Kennedy to James Webb. This is not, oh, it's expo exploration, isn't it beautiful? It is, there was no such dialogue. Here's a bust of President Kennedy in Kennedy Space Center, Florida. And chiseled in the granite, I believe this nation should commit itself before the decade is out to put a man on the moon, return him safely to Earth. We all can hear those words. They're stirring. What they left out is the speech where that quote comes from was to a joint session of Congress six weeks after Yuri Gagarin came out of orbit. The United States did not have a rocket that wouldn't explode on takeoff, a human-rated rocket. So we freaked out. Does that translate in the translators? Freak out? <laughs> I don't know how else to say that. There's no, that's the word. We freaked out. So what he says before this is, if we are to show the world the path of freedom over the path of tyranny, then we need, if the events of recent weeks, wouldn't even mention Yuri Gagarin's name, if the events of recent weeks are any indication of this, the impact of this adventure on the minds of men everywhere, then we need to show the world the path of freedom over the path of tyranny. It was a war driver. That was in the same speech where this quote was uttered. Why didn't we put that in the, in the granite? Plenty of space to chisel in, beat the Russians. That's left out. 
Well, yes, we went to the moon. Yes, 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 we did this. Driven by Cold War fear. So all the people who are not thinking Cold War fear, thinking that going to the moon was just the thing people do, when we stopped going to the moon, people cried foul. People said, we just need the charisma that Kennedy had and that'll fix everything. We just need the political will like we used to have. No, what we needed is Russians who want to go to the moon ahead of us. <laughs> there was a side benefit. This photo, Apollo 8. This is the 50th anniversary this year of that photo, December. Apollo 8 goes to the moon, orbits a dozen times, 15 times, does not land. It is the first time we leave Earth for another destination, ever. In some ways, this is more significant than Apollo 11. No one had left Earth before. Yeah, we go into orbit. People like to think of that as leaving Earth, but not really. In a schoolroom globe, this International Space Station is orbiting half a centimeter above the globe. And we've all sort of bought into the idea that that's space. To an astrophysicist, that's just driving around the block. <laughs> After this photo was taken, here's what happened, something unexpected. We went to the moon to explore the moon and we discovered Earth for the first time. No one had seen this before. Spaceship Earth. Earth as nature intends you to view it. Not with color-coded countries as in your schoolroom, but with just oceans and land and clouds. This was the beginning of the modern environmental movement. 